I found it. Or yours, Simon. Or yours, Simon. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, it's um, the um, for those of you who were here last uh, time, you'll notice that there was a distinct absence, which was me, and uh, Dave was uh, was man in the helm. Uh, very admirably without me as it was my uh, my 50th birthday uh, I think it was actually on my 50th birthday so um, uh, in return I very valiantly offered to uh, uh, to lead the charge on my own this evening however um, young Dave has, uh, has has popped along anyway <laughs> um, uh, uh, which is which is brilliant which means that Dave can do all of the uh, all of the chat the back chat um uh answering questions and etc but the good news is dave does have a guest appearance around about slide 25 um and he's going to talk to you uh, a little bit about the merlin app as well because dave's well techy and uh, i haven't actually got around to uh, to using it yet so um but for the most part i'm going to be taking you through the species tonight uh let dave have a little bit of a uh, uh an evening off but he's going to be putting little snippets into the chat of uh of, uh, of his experiences based on what we've got and um, we've gone for a slightly uh smaller subset of species those of you that have been doing this um uh regularly uh will know that we we, we tend to cover quite a lot of species um in a fairly shortish time and we thought actually tonight we're going to we're going to re reduce those number of species, but we're going to spend a little bit more time uh, on each of those ones. And we're going to sort of really push it towards the, the farmland. Now, we we kept it in the theme of scrub and farmland because quite typically any of your survey sites you'll be going on will probably have a little scrubby area. But it'll probably be associated with a, uh, a you know, or next to uh, you know an agricultural land block. Seventy-two percent of the UK is, as a minimum, is covered um, by um, agriculture, and uh, there was some estimates that that's even up to nearly seventy-six percent. So when we think we're not too far away uh, from a uh, from a, um, a a field of some description. Um, you'll notice that uh, a lot of the birds that we're going to be talking about tonight probably will occur um, in in one form or another. Certainly, in the areas that we're that we're looking at tonight as well. Um, as Dave's probably explained to you uh, last time, it's scrub is incredible. It, it really does hold a huge density of birds um, from the scrubby warblers all the way through dunnocks and wrens and robins. Song thrushes, blackbird. It's a real um, uh, great area, and when you're doing your surveying, it's uh, it's it's a fantastic location uh, for you to just stop. And because uh, sometimes we uh, we're, we're enjoying the survey so much, we we sometimes stop to enjoy just how exciting that bird song is on that uh, on that early morning. Um, so. We're going to be looking at tonight what we could expect on a given decent set of farmland survey area. Um, you'll notice immediately behind the uh, um, the tricky pear species there is a wonderful corn bunting. We're going to see a little bit more of that uh, later on. But I just wanted to go over um, and I uh, and you we, again we've Dave and I have been talking about these in the field sessions as well as on these these webinars and i thought it was just very very useful to go back over um these top tips uh, you'll notice i put my my name in brackets there because uh, dave originally wrote these top tips but they're they're ones that we as surveyors use quite a lot um what's really important and why we do these little bite-sized webinars is to go there with species in mind okay you're going into scrubby farmland you, you've probably only got a choice of about 20 or 25 species now that isn't much it doesn't sound much when we go if we think some of our um the species list that dave and i have got in various locations you know we struggle to get 30 species sometime and quite a few of them are corvids and buzzards and kites so when we think in down to i guess the songbird level if you're on a scrubby farmlandy area you probably only got 15 or 20 species maximum that it could be so when we think about you know when you're going out your your list of species is quite reduced than if you were going to minsmere or if you were going to the middle of a deciduous woodland 
So always have that in mind. Where am I surveying and what type of species am I likely to see? Um, as Dave's mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about the Merlin up later. But always, you know, take your take your Collins guide. If you've got a Collins guide on your phone or if, you know, if you take your book around, you know, you, something sings or you see a, see a glimpse of something more nine times out of 10. If you've got that block of 20 species, you think that was probably that. Um, we as birders, we always like to think that we've found rare stuff. Um, Nick, Dave and myself, we've been surveying for many, many years. Um, and we occasionally come across something half decent, but we've never sort of, uh, you know, we've never come across anything mega rare. And for the most part, the the things that we think, um, that oh, was that a such and such? It will, let's go common first. That should be our thought process when we're out surveying. Um, was that really a dick sizzle? No, it was probably a badly seen reed bunting. So if we go for that sort of shutting down those species, you will tend to get a much more um, uh, instructive survey when we're when we're out as well. Um, and the second point there it takes time to scan ahead. A lot of us don't really do this. We sort of we focus on the species that we can get now. But take a little bit of time. Stop at that hedgerow. Stop at that scrubby hedgerow and just scan down it. See if you can get that glint of yellow from the yellow hammer. Maybe you can see that sort of brown blob, which will then turn into be a corn bunting. Or you might get that splash of red, which might indicate that there's a linnet singing down there. Um, because quite often as we're walking those hedgerows, we only see the birds at the last minute. So spend a little bit of time thinking about where you are and thinking about what that next species is going to be. And then as we were just um, having a little chat with Susie at the beginning, um, what did you see last time? What did you see last time you were out? When you were in this particular area, was it good for yellow hammer? Was it good for ye yellow wagtail? Was there last year, was there a corn bunting in this area? Was there was there a pied wagtail in this area? Um, it's really useful to remember what you had last time. And if you do regular sites, and you, even if they're not on survey sites, you sort of get to a point, you're like, I haven't heard the song thrush yet. And then suddenly the song thrush will probably be there. Um, and we also try and sort of, you'll notice when you're out with Dave and me, we'll suddenly be shouting all these random names of species that you've not even seen yet. And neither have we. What we've done is we've heard them um, or we've seen a very distant glimpse of something that's coming out of a hedgerow. And we know where we are. We know there's that slim down set of 10 or 15 species. And for the most part, um, we, you know, we probably make a little bit of an educated guess as well. If we see something yellow miles away in a hedgerow, we, you know, it's probably going to be a yellow hammer, but it might be a yellow wagtail. But we say the the first thing that, that comes into our head, and if that follows up and there's a uh, a little bit of bread and no cheese song coming out of it, we were right, and it was probably a yellow hammer. So as you can see, um, is. <laughs> <laughs> so I just read Nick's comment then. Every bird, absolutely, every bird is half decent. Um, I, I, it, we're going to get some awesome birds on Lodge Hill, actually. There's going to be some decent corn bunnings, absolutely. Um, but try and get your ears in. Uh, we said that last time, you know, sometimes on surveys, your ears are, are important as your eyes now. I know, um, you know, I was on surveys a week before last. Nick's been on surveys today and a few, a few last week. And for the most part, we're just, you know, maybe most of what we're writing down is what we can hear. Um, it's great if we can see the stuff. <laughs> but, you know, we, you know, probably 80% of our time, we're not even lifting our bins because we know there's a robin there. We know there's a dunnock. And that's why we're trying to do these a set of these webinars to enable you to get a lot more confident um, about naming that particular bird as well. And again, it's about noticing the, the long tail of the buntings, the short tail, fork tails of the finches. It's about noticing those subtle differences as house martins and swallows and sand martins and swifts start flying over. So we do when we do get our opportunity to look at something, it's about trying to identify it as quickly as possible. So as I said, we have made it a little bit shorter tonight in terms of species. So we've put together these uh, species pairs, and I certainly have had a lot of feedback about these when we've been out. 
Um, we, uh, we we struggled with Garden Warbler and Black Cap again at Ivanhoe. Is that Garden Warbler? Is that, that little Black Cap? Is it a Garden Warbler? Um, and for me, uh, the Ivanhoe trip, I think that was my first Garden Warbler of the year. And it took me a little bit of time to get my ear into it. And Dave and Nick will probably say as well, it's just those first couple of weeks of getting the black caps and the garden warblers back in, in, in numbers and your ear starts to tune in. So we're going to have a little look at those um, as a species. White throat and lesser white throat. We tried so hard up by know to get lesser white throat. Um, I think everybody before us heard them and everyone after us heard them, but we didn't. we couldn't manage to get them. So we're going to have a little look at those two um, species as well. Um, hopefully both of them will encounter on uh, on Lodge Hill. Certainly we had some fantastic white throats um, last time we were up there and hopefully there might be a, a few lesser white throats in as well. And interestingly, I've put back in wood pigeon and stock dove. And the reason for that is we we still had a few a few people with a few conundrums when we were out at um, Brandenham. Is that a stock dove? Is that a wood pigeon? So again, we've got a little bit a uh, little bit of a closer view on the, those two. Um, some new new entries into the uh, into the pack: um, yellow wagtail and pied wagtail. Um, again, we've just started to see quite a few yellow wagtails started to come back, and quite a few are setting up on territory now. And although they um, they they look fairly distinct on the surface, we're going to just give you a little bit more detail um, about what you might be able to see from habitat perspective as well. Then we've got our old friend skylark and meadow pipit. Hopefully, uh, again, we'll see a few of these in uh, in uh, in the next uh, uh, the next trip. And um, yeah, we we seem to have got skylark pretty much every every out in, and I'm sure we'll have them even on the uh, on the uh, June trip as well. And then lastly, yellowhammer and corn bunting. Um, and again, from a perspective of a a decent farmland survey, um, if we if we would get maybe 80, 90% of these species, that would be an absolutely amazing survey. Um, some of my surveys, I, I get a yellow egg tail, I don't get corn bunting, um, or I get lots of skylarks and no meadow pipits. So if we can come out of Lodge Hill on uh, on Saturday with uh, with a fair proportion of these, that would be absolutely, uh, absolutely fantastic. And also I popped in a slide of the uh, of the odd surprise as well. So there's uh, there's three additional species that hopefully, fingers crossed, we might encounter. Uh, one of them's getting a little bit too late, but the others uh, might still be around as well. Um, I'm going to stop sharing at this point, um, only because I haven't shared with my sound, and we all know what that means. No one can actually hear anything. So um, I'm going to share with sound this time. And what that should be is when we play the uh, songs in a moment, you should all hear them. Okay. So first up, the garden warbler. Um, some nasty, nasty birders call this a very drab looking warbler. I think this is a, a warbler bathed in subtleness. It's got that lovely gray shawl around its neck and if you see a garden warbler you know garden warblers are slow they 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 love just lumbering through uh the shrubs the, the trees um except when you're at lodge hill when the one that we saw absolutely shot through like a rocket um and then sung from deep within a, a blackberry bush for the time that we were there but typically they when you see garden warblers um they do stick around um, sometimes mistaken for female black caps, and we'll see a picture of a female black cap in a moment. But for the most part, subtle grey and almost a plain faced look, I think, is the uh, um, is the main. I love the I love the the bird guide's description there as well. It talks about mild expression. I always think sort of garden warblers are just sort of just they're just bemused with light, having a, having a check around. Black caps look a little bit more intense, but um, the garden warblers are just in, enjoying life as well. Um, what um, the key thing when we always say about black cap and garden warbler is length of song. Now, unfortunately, those black, those pesky black caps, um, they're now getting into the full swing of things. Um, there's more black caps around. So what you might be getting is you might be getting black caps doing a longer song. Um, it's not necessarily that they're doing it in the same fluty way as a garden warbler, 
um, but they just don't stop as often as they do when they first arrived. But we're still going to be listening out for that sort of more fluty, melodic song of the uh, Garden Warbler. And here we go. As you can see from the description, they're fluty, really lovely, fluty description carried on. Um, and again, completely at odds with the mild expression, the plain faced uh, view of Garden Warbler as well. Um, and as we've said there, it's typically it's higher up um, than Black Cap. However, we were seeing some Black Cap singing from the tops of the trees last, last visit. Um, so they do vary. They don't always uh, always play the game. Uh, but typically, if you uh, if you're standing underneath a particularly fluty, fluid a song, then yeah, keep your eyes out for that very grey um, thing. The other thing to notice as well is those sort of bluey grey legs as well, very distinctive on Garden Warbler. And then black caps, um, as we can see, the female black cap at the bottom, uh, the the brown cap, uh, can be very 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 loosely mistaken for a garden warbler. However, once you see that sort of uh, browny cap, uh, quite obvious. They've still got that little sort of grayish sheen, but not in that sort of subtle way that the uh, the garden warbler has as well. And for the for the males, that very obvious black cap as well. Um, as we said, the songs very sort of once you get your ear in into it, much harsher song than the actual uh, than the garden warbler. Much shorter sections as well. Why there's such a long pause at the end? I thought we'd edited, we'd edited that out. Um, uh, as you can see, much shorter uh, bursts of song. Still very pretty, very melodic, um, but I think it just lacks that fluty essence that the uh, the Garden Warbler has. And when you see them side by side, actually, they are quite quite distinctive. The black cap still has that sort of greyish wash that goes all the way down um, onto the belly. Um, what I would tend to do as a rule of thumb is if you if you think it's a black cap, it's probably a black cap. But um, it's, if if you get good views of it and it's a garden warbler, put it down as a garden warbler. What typically when when I'm out surveying, um, I, I would expect to get almost sort of a ten to one um, on black caps and garden warblers. However, in saying that, they've had a lot of garden warblers at uh, at Lodge Hill. Um, when they went last week, so um, in certain areas they will they will have a, uh, a different density. But typically, if I'm ever going out, I, I expect to hear many more black caps than I do um, garden warbler. So we're just going to have the black cap recap again. Quite short bursts, eight seconds roughly. Garden Warbler. A lot 
lot more floaty, a lot longer, just that continuous stream of uh, uh, of consciousness that's coming out from the garden warbler there. Um, as I said, they're uh, they're uh, they're getting into full swing now, both black caps and garden warblers, um, and hopefully we'll have a real chance on uh, on Saturday uh, to differentiate between the two as well. Okay, so that's garden warbler and black cap. I can see that um, uh, Babe's doing doing the good stuff in the chat there, so I'll, I'll ignore that for uh, uh, for now if that's okay. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll. Uh, and, any of your surveys, you might expect to get one or two of these species as we uh, as we go through the next couple of weeks. Okay, moving on, and um, we're sticking with warblers. Good news is, um, if warblers are tricky for you, uh, we've only got four of them tonight, so um, it's only uh, only the four main warblers that we'll be looking at. Um, common white throat, as you can see, they uh, they uh, they came up with a great name of this when you see the actual white throat when you see one in full song that uh that white throat is very very obvious as well rusty wings and that sort of lovely grayish um, cap as well and you can see there um which will we'll show you differently from the uh, lesser white throat in a minute quite often has that cap raised um as does black cap actually black cap quite often has its raised especially when it's in that full sort of song cycle as well and what quite a lot of people noticed from the ones when we were at um, uh, at Ivanhoe is that white eye ring is actually quite distinct when you uh, when you see it in the field um, and you get good views. What we also see with the white throats is that um, uh, that tendency to fly up as high as they can and then sort of come straight down to land exactly on that same area as well. Um, love cow parsley, love nettle patches, love brambles. Uh, so hopefully we'll we'll encounter a couple of those at uh, at Lodge Hill as well. Um, the white throat song. Mr. Scratchy. Very short sort of bursts of song. Quite often with a, a, a scold put in there as well, where they're sort of, uh, especially if you're too close, starts chucking quite uh, distinctly at you. Very scratchy, as I say, often delivered from the top of a, a bramble set before going into that sort of uh, that song flight as well. And when we think of the lesser white throat, actually the lesser white throat is, um, as its name suggests, it's uh, it's lesser seen. Um, it's, again, if I go out on a typical survey, I probably hope to see five, six, seven, eight white throats, common white throats, if I'm very lucky, uh, maybe one or two lesser white throats. So again, in terms of that percentage of you um, encountering these birds, uh, white throats will be in in a, in a slightly um, uh, more plentiful supply. Um, the key thing for me is that lesser white throats tend to be singing for quite a while before you realise, and it's only um, especially when you when you uh, for those of you that are sort of familiar with wrens, uh, and right at the end of a, of a wren song you get this lovely little change, um, and for me I suddenly sort of lesser white throat has been singing for ages. And I've only just heard it. It sort of suddenly comes into your your consciousness. Um, much more skulky. I love the word skulky. Much more skulky than common white throat. These won't be sitting on the top of the hedge and doing song flights. Very much will be singing from within the bushes. Um, if you're lucky, um, as I was a couple of weeks ago, uh, I had two uh, two males fighting each other. Uh, they literally about a, a yard, two yards in front of me. They were going at each other. They were chacking away. They were completely oblivious of me and had some fantastic views. Um, but that's very, very rare. They tend to to skulk a little bit and uh, more often heard than seen. And what you're really listening out for with a lesser white throat is, for me, is this this rattle right at the end. Did 
Do 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 do. And what you'll notice as well is we're approximately, yeah, we're 40 seconds in and it's uh, it's done that rattle about three times. I was out the other day uh, and there was a very strong singing lesser white throw and I was counting 12 seconds between each. <laughs> so uh, again, if you suddenly think, what's that lesser white throw? Stop, count to 12, maybe 15 and see if it calls again. Uh, and typically it does. But yeah, what we're listening out for is that. Do it one more time. Those of you with great hearing will probably hear there's a, there's a there is a there is a song before that uh, that chi 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 chi. But I normally hone in on that uh, on that secondary sort of uh, chi 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 chi. Um, but again, we'll be listening out for that uh, at Lodge Hill, especially when we get to the uh, the paddocks area. I know a lot of the scrub clearance that Nick and the team have done have made it absolutely fantastic uh, for lesser white throats up there. So um, hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, we've um, we, we might get some uh, lesser white throats. Um, when the two are seen together, um, yes, they do both have white throats. Uh, I think when when the uh, the individual was naming uh, these species. Didn't think they got beyond that. Um, I think they could have called lesser white throat skulky, evil warbler. Sometimes they uh, they do take a little bit of uh, of, of of finding, um, but ultimately they they're very different in their in their attitudes. They're very different in their um, in their habitats for a lot for lots of uh, things. Um, you'll get common white throats in rape seed. You'll get common white throats in small bramble areas. Whereas the lesser white folk really love those sort of um, black thorn hedges, um, which white folks, common white folks do as well. But for the most part, um, if you're walking down a, a very mature black thorn hedge, listen out for that uh, for that uh, sort of ch -ch 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 right at the end. So what you might be listening out for, scratchy, scratchy. Looks like he's having a chat with you. Or... Maybe 12 seconds. Less common white throat and lesser white throat. Excellent. Obviously, any questions? Please keep them in there. Dave's, uh, Dave and Nick will be uh, will be on the ball in terms of answering all of those. So uh, don't uh, don't wait for the end or wait for me to finish. Um, two species again that we uh, we felt needed a little bit of a recap. Um, even though we do spend quite a lot of time going through these on the uh, on the sessions. Um, just useful every now and then, just to have a little recap, even for the commoner species. Um, wood pigeons, although they're extremely common, um, and we probably see tens, if not hundreds, on most of our surveys, um, they're actually now on the amber list of birds of conservation concern. They've they've reduced up to twenty five to thirty five percent of their numbers across Europe uh, in the last twenty years. Um, in some locations, up to fifty percent. Um, although that might not seem the case, obviously the, the trends that of your surveys amongst all of the other surveys are doing are showing that these birds are on the decline. So everything we can do now to uh, to help them would be uh, is fantastic. Um, what you are looking out for in flight uh, typically is that broad white band on the wing um, with the uh, white um, sort of uh, side collar um, that they got. Typically, you can see both of those quite well in flight. Um, even from uh, even from below, the the wood pigeons are quite identifiable. They tend to be a little bit, uh, probably 15, 20 percent bigger 
um, than stock doves. So if you are in an area with a lot of stock doves, it will pay for you to um, just keep checking your skills against the wood pigeons that are flying out from the woods versus versus the stock doves. And we'll look at the stock dove in a moment. But really, get anything with with a white band on the wing, that white uh, neck patch, and very much likely to be wood pigeon. Um, wood pigeon are also the bane of most people's lives if you live in a lovely sort of countryside setting. They're the ones that sit on your roof at 4.30 a.m. and uh, let the world know that they're there. They're rather lovely, actually, but not if you need a lot of sleep. Um, what you might also hear very occasionally is it's very faint in this clip, um, but you'll get the display flight of the wood pigeon as well, which is a clap, clap of its wings. If you listen very carefully, just towards the end of this clip, you'll hear a little flutter of the wing clap as well. That's a displaying bird. little claps of the wing there just at the end there um so that's the wood pigeon and again the reason that this gets confused oh thought it's going again um is with the slightly smaller stock dove and um we uh, we put this wonderful quote in and i can't remember whether it was dave or, or myself i think we both had it uh, we had a wonderful person on the course called said it was stockier in flight Although I've been, you know, birding for 33 years, I've never, I've never thought of that terminology before. But they do; they look thicker set, um, they look chunky. Um, but also, as you can see, there's no white wing bar. In fact, they're very much black on grey. Um, and although it's quite strange to, uh, to, to sort of use that terminology because wood pigeons grey, stock doves look greyer. They look very grey and black. Whereas wood pigeon actually is quite a uh, quite a lighter grey, and it doesn't because of the white wing band, um, it doesn't appear as quite contrasty as um, as stock doves. Um, what you also notice is no white patch on the neck. They've got this beautiful green um, sort of uh, area that uh, just shines in the uh, in the sunshine as well. Um, and when they fly off, typically you'll see that lovely big thick black band on the tail with those big black um, sets of primaries there, and they just they just feel stockier um, than a uh, than a, than a stock dove, uh, sorry, than a wood pigeon. But again, best best thing you can do, and you know both Dave and I get this a lot, is that um, how did you how can you tell? You've just seen this single bird flying out of a woodland at three miles away, and you just you just can. Over time, you just get a feel of whether or not it's going to be a wood pigeon or a stock dove. Um, the other thing that we noticed while we was at Ivanhoe, and it was again, it's one of those things that you probably have always thought about, um, is the stock doves, the pairs, if two birds come out, they fly really close together. They fly really close together. The wood pigeons their pairs fly slightly further apart, always one in front of the other, whereas the stock dove seems to be a tighter unit. Um, and typically any pair of stock doves that you see out on your surveys now, whether they're on the feed in the fields or they're coming out of the tree, are likely to be a pair. Um, they're likely to be a male and female pair, either feeding together, um, uh, male breeders, or not just have not got round to it yet. So um, again, if you're recording, if you see two stock doves feeding together in a field, again, they'll probably more likely um, be a pair of stock doves. Um, we always love to hear stock doves when we're, when we're out. And the way that I best describe these is they always seem perpetually amused um, and surprised at, uh, at the world going on around them.
Very distinct to the wood pigeon song again. Again, when you see them side by side in picture form now, actually, you think, wow, that, they are very distinct. But when you're flying over at uh, 20 miles an hour on a sort of a, a misty survey morning, um, it really is about seeing as much detail as you can on those wings. Um, get the uh, uh, the sort of plain neck of the stock dove versus the, the white band of the, of the wood pigeon. You see the eye colour there is also quite distinct as well. Okay, so we are all up to speed now. Oh, there we go. The stock dove so it wants to sing again. Um, if we are super lucky, we are going to get a blaze of colour on um, uh, on Saturday. Uh, we're going to get this beacon of yellow sitting, hopefully, on top of the uh, uh, of the crops at um, at Lodge Hill. Um, I don't know, uh, Nick, Nick, Nick might be able to pop into the uh, chat there. I don't know if uh, how many yellow wagtails are, are on territory at Lodge Hill. Uh, if it comes back at no, I've, I've bigged this up for nothing. Um, but it, uh, it always looks like a good area that should uh, that should get uh, should get yellow wagtails. Um, and as you can see there, if you've never seen a yellow wagtail before, um, the first sight that, uh, that you see of these amazing yellow birds um, for a lot of people, it's 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 sort of almost a, you know, a mind blowing the way that they actually sort of shine, especially um, um, <laughs> that's, that's a bit of Frankie Howard there. Three on the muck pile. There we go. So we've got we've got something to look out for then uh, when we get there. Um, the thing that you might be first attracted to uh, the yellow wagtail is it. You might just be hear it uh, hear it call. Very distinctive, raspy call, and it's a it's a call that when you learn, it's one that just sort of sits in your mind forever, and you'll just be walking through a, a field, and you'll suddenly hear one of these um, flying over. These calls can be given in flight, or if they're sitting on the top of a hedge, or they're sitting on top of a um, uh, a wheat field, and once you get that raspiness into your head actually it never never really goes and you might be forgiven for thinking um uh simon forgot to put the collins guide uh picture in all of our all of our um photographs normally get associated with the collins guide the, the Collins guide falls a little bit flat, in my opinion, on the yellow wagtails. So without getting into too much detail, there are lots and lots and lots of different types of yellow wagtails that occur all across Europe. Um, I think the Collins guide depicts about 12 of the subspecies. And the one it mainly shows is a bird called the blue-headed wagtail, which is the, um, the, the near continent counterpart of yellow wagtail. Uh, so the yellow wagtails that we see in the UK, those vibrant yellow ones, um, are, are typically mostly seen in Europe and in, in very much far Western Europe and the UK. As you start to go further east, they get replaced by blue-headed and black-headed and ashy-headed and grey-headed. And I just thought that the uh, the picture in the Collins Guide would have just further complicated things, which is why I gave you two pictures of yellow wagtail. Um, we only get mild uh, complications with pied wagtail. Um, insofar, we get two different types um, in the UK as a general rule. I'm not going to go into any other of the uh, pied wagtails we might be getting. Um, so we have the pied wagtail, which is, uh, I guess, the, the 
the British wagtail. It mostly occurs in the UK. It's that real dark black thorn that you can see there. And then on the picture on the right hand side, at the bottom, you've got uh, the white wagtail, which again is the European sort of counterpart of pride wagtail. But for the most part, for us on surveys, um, we'll probably be seeing that the um, the uh, the pied wagtails. Um, this is our traditional wagtail. It's the one that we see wagging its tail the most. Uh, Grey wagtails and yellow wagtails also do wag their tails, but I think pieds just seem to have a monopoly on doing it a lot. Um, the key thing for me around pied wagtails is I always think of it as the words of the description is twizzig. Twizzig. Um, see if that. See if you. See if you hear a twizzig in this as well. Twizzig. Twizzig. Quite different to the raspy calls of the uh, of the yellow wagtails, and I've got um, two of the surveys that I do. Uh, have have old barns with corrugated roofs, and both of them have got a pair of pine wagtails just wandering up up and down the corrugated uh, um, roofs there. So, if you're lucky enough, especially if you've got a, um, a, a the perfect pine wagtail habitat is a is an old barn with a corrugated roof and a little puddle just by the uh, the side of it, and you'll see the pine wagtails flying down to the puddle, then back up onto the corrugated roof. Um, a bird that we often overlook because we, we do see them quite often. They're very much around towns and uh, um, uh, at our local parks, but they really are a bird of the uh, of the farmland. And uh, um, it's great to see them in, uh, in, in decent numbers as well at the moment. So when you see, oh, there we go. When you see them together, pretty unmistakable, um, but very much different in their, uh, in their both ways. Again, the raspy call of the yellow wagtail. And the more high pitch sort of physic physic two notes physic 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 whereas I always think of the yellow wag tail as a sort of more Spear, much drawn out, and hopefully we'll get uh, we'll get a uh, uh, the opportunity to to hear both of those on uh, on Saturday. Okay. Oops, moving forward then. Old friend the Skylark. Now um, I imagine you got quite a few on the last Lodge Hill uh, trip. We got some amazing views on um, uh, Ivanhoe Beacon. I think someone, one of our one of our teams said that's it. They never have to see another skylark um, again because the uh, the views that they had was imprinted uh, on their mind. It was uh, right almost by the beacon, and it just sat there as we approached, singing its singing its heart out on a backdrop of grass. Um, and uh, we really got to study all of the subtleties uh, of skylark. Um, it's a species that probably most of us are quite familiar with, so we're just going to sort of. Uh, do a little uh, a reminder of this. They're the ones that are in the background all the time when we're typically on surveys. We always have a competition on our walks is to find the black dot. 200, 300, 400 meters up and they're still singing and they know exactly where to come back down to in that field. What you might hear as well is as you disturb them from the edges of the fields, you might hear this chirp, chirp. And typically, if a skylark is about to sing, you might just hear that little chirp, and then it will go straight into the song flight. Um, the tricky sort of species alongside Skylark, the meadow pipit. Um, again, this is another bird that parachutes. So you might have seen them at Ivanhoe alongside of the white throat. 
um, is they'll they'll be singing from the uh, from the top of a bush or top of a, a hedge, and it's a little launch into this uh, uh, into this uh, parachute flight. And uh, as I said, there the most melodic parachutist you'll find. Typically delivered as it comes back down to exactly the same bush that it's just taken off from. Very different to the Skylark. Starts to get a lot quicker as well as it starts to get closer and closer to its perch. It's, it's, um, and typically, if we um, if we disturb them, seep 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 seep. Um, very often in the middle of sort of rapeseed fields or crop fields, you'll suddenly hear this seep seep, and a, a meadow pipit will get up from there as well. So when you see and here, Meadow Pipit, well, they are very distinct and different to Skylark, but some people still sort of struggle um, with the two there. As you can see, physiologically, the Skylark is a little bit more dumpier. It's um, Although it's a slightly larger, uh, it tends to sort of scrubble a little bit um, uh, on the floor, whereas the Meadow Pipit runs, runs quite fast, hops around a little bit, but typically it runs. Um, if you get really good views of it, you'll see that sort of streaky breast of the meadow pipit. Um, whilst Skylark does have a few streaks, it's not as well um, marked as the uh, as the meadow pipit. And typically, the Skylark will have that little raised crest as well. And what you'll be thinking about from if you sort of flush a little brown bird up in front of you, whether it's during survey season or during the winter, if it makes chirrup, chirrup. Chirrup tends to be, oh, no, no, that's too fast. It tends to be a skylark. And if it starts to seep, 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 Simon, Simon, just quickly while you're on the skylark, just quickly while you're in the top tips world, skylark can be quite tricky when you're on a survey to count. To know where how many you've got, where they're coming from. Um, top tips from you and or Dave, I guess, in terms of how you try and when you've got particularly a massive arable field, and there could be one over there, it could be here, trying to hear where they come from. Top tips on how you try and narrow down to a count. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do mine first, then we'll then I'll, I'll get we'll get Dave's uh, view on it. Um, so skylarks, although they can cover a large area up. Um, they tend to have a quite a well-defined set of territory when they're a lot lower. Um, even though that territory can cope completely, they, they don't care about hedges. Um, they can their part of their territory can be in one field, and then and the other part can be over the hedge in another field as well. So if I'm walking, a, say walking around the edge of a field, um, and I'm hearing a skylark over to my left, and I'm hearing a skylark over to my right, and a, there might be another one further on. If I've walked about 30 or 40 metres and I'm still hearing a skylark over to my left, it's probably not the same one as I've just walked. Um, so I sort of tend to give myself a bit of distance before it. Another really good way is to just stop and scan. Uh, stop and scan and you'll see two, three, four skylarks coming up um, uh, out of the uh, um, uh, out of the crop. And typically, if you've scared one and it's chirruped quite loudly and it started singing, that will normally prompt uh, another one to sing. Um, when you're surveying, what's the worst that could happen? You know, there might be eight skylarks. You might record ten skylarks. You know, it's um, I would always err uh, on more skylarks than you can actually than you think you're hearing. Um, uh, you know, if if you think you're hearing eight or nine. And you can see so a few dots and there's some ones flying, you're probably more likely to be 12 or 13. Uh, but again, just pace yourself. Uh, the louder the song, uh, all those skylarks will sort of go up and down and then move around a bit. If you're suddenly, if you've lost sound of one and another one kicks in, count that as a second. <laughs> third. Dave, what's your views on uh, on skylark counting? Well, it's not, yeah, it's not a it's not an exact science. Um, the only thing I'd add to to what you said is 
potentially if you've got a, a large field is, is, is to try and divide it up perhaps into quadrants or octet or, or, or sort of eighths or something like that and just just try and keep a view in terms of where you're seeing the birds coming down into or coming up from and then that might give you a bit of a, a, a clue in terms of just how many pairs there might be um but yeah i mean it's the males that sing um you know the females at this time of the year are probably down in the crop sitting on a nest somewhere um so just just bear that in mind you know if there's a male singing there's probably two um even if you're not seeing two so just uh just just work on that that premise really yeah and another thing that's quite complicated even for surveyors is um a, a couple of males might be fighting and interacting but also uh it might be a male and two females or two females and two males and and so you'll, you'll suddenly get this little cluster of skylarks all singing and uh, and 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 uh, interacting with each other, and you think, what do I record that as? Four males, two males, two females. Um, typically, the when a male and female are interacting, it's a little bit nicer. So if there's a huge amount of tail chasing um, just over the crops, they're probably two males. Um, but again, you know what we're doing here is we're we're doing a rough guess. Um, of the skylarks and if you write down a couple more than there actually are it's not going to be the end of the world um yeah don't feel don't feel bad about putting uh, putting your skylarks down in, in whatever number that is um thank you right last two species then now um our, our wonderful friend uh, a little bit of bread and no cheese um a few people have said that it should be some cheese um when the, the this was a this was certainly from my grandma taught me this so I, I think this was a maybe when when people didn't understand phonetic terms and stuff but I still think it's a, a, a little bit of bread no cheese um but obviously people tend to make up their own mind um see if you see if, see if it is no for you or see if it's some. Doesn't even want any cheese from the sound of it. Is it? Uh... What you heard then just before the song was actually the yellow hammer call. Tip, tip. Now, what a lot of male yellow hammers who are very confident in their skin, they're very bright yellow. Um, they've already got a mate, just chilling around somewhere. They don't even bother a little bit, a little bit of bread and no cheesing. They've had, they've had their bread, they've had their cheese. And what you'll find is they just sit at the top of the tree and tick, uh, especially when you're walking underneath the, uh, the tree as well. Um, so again, this isn't uh, for the most part when you're getting into May and you see a yellow hammer sort of ticking from the top of the tree. He's not, he's not just sort of calling. He's probably warning his um, his uh, the female who may already be on a nest somewhere that there's a little bit of danger around. Uh, but other um, um, unmarried, unpaired yellow hammers will still be uh, shouting out a little bit of red no cheese as well. Um, always a good idea, as we said at the beginning, to um, scan ahead down the uh, down the hedgerow, especially if you can hear a little bit of bread and no cheese, because it's very likely it's going to be right at the top of the tallest tree in the hedge, or it's going to be right on the top of the hedgerow as well. Um, the uh, the uh, the females uh, are slightly drabber uh obviously we, we know that's not the case in uh in real life with the ladies looking incredibly lovely um that's purely for when they're sitting on their nests and they don't want to be as uh, as ostentatious uh, as the males as well um but however it's typically the females that get most mistaken uh with our next star which is the uh which is the corn bunting and we are, we are, we're definitely going to see some uh, corn buntings on uh, on Lodge Hill. 
Um, we did have a very brief bird on Ivanhoe. Um, I know Peter, who was on our team, is uh, he's come in Lodge Hill specifically because he's never seen a, uh, a corn bunt in here. He had a very fleeting glimpse of the one on Lodge Hill, uh, which just sort of pitched up in front of about five of us and uh, done one call and then flew off again. So we're hoping for a much more uh, protracted uh, display at, uh, at Lodge Hill as well. Um, what you'll notice there from the bottom right-hand picture is quite typically they'll have their legs dangling as they uh, as they take off. Um, and you might hear them uh, again quilloping as they uh, as they as they take off. This is the corn bunting call. Very, very believe me, oh, yes. <laughs> you might be thinking it sounds exactly like a hammer, um, but it's a much more lower, subtler tick, tick, tick. Um, but what you're going to be hearing, hopefully, is not one of our party uh, finding out if where their car keys are, but you're going to be listening out for the uh, corn bunting with its jangly keys. <laughs> and as you've got incredible hearing like Dave, you'll probably be able to hear them miles away on the uh, on the uh, pylons um when we get to lodge hill and um, we suddenly think oh where where are they and they're right above us and <laughs> singing their singing their hearts out and if we get a good enough view as we did last year we could really see that um the male corn bunting with its bill open it almost seems to um uh sort of uh open its bill wider than it's, uh, it looks possible um, but uh, the, the power that the corn bunting actually puts into that song. Again, another sort of, you know, people say quite a drab looking bird, but I think they're quite, uh, I think they're quite cool looking actually. And when you see um, that jangly legs, they actually nest. Um, a lot of people think they nest in the hedgerows. They don't, they nest in the middle of the fields. Um, and so what you'll see is what their, their song perch is, is on the hedgerows but then they're flying out um, to where their actual nest is. So really useful for, for us from a surveying perspective. If you're seeing a bird sing, that's fantastic. But if you can see where it goes to, where it lands, that's really critical as well. And uh, again, you know, working with the farmers, um, it's about you know, getting them to, to leave, those, uh, leave those crops as long as possible to allow uh, for successful uh, corn bunting and fledging as well. This is the Yellow Hammer song. A little Yellow Hammer uh, uh, tick then in the middle of it. Call down to. I always find that corn buntings are, are also probably there. They're suddenly there. You suddenly hear the song and you think, "Oh my! I've been listening to that for about the last minute or so, and I hadn't actually uh, hadn't actually cottoned on." And then the surprises. These are where we're um, with our fingers crossed. They look exotic, don't they? Um, the, we know that one of our group, I think Lavinia, um, had a ring oozel at Lodge Hill about a week and a half ago. Um, we talked about the ring oozel on the, uh, at Ivanhoe. We weren't lucky enough to see one, um, but um, she, was, uh, she was able to find a, a, a fantastic male. It's getting right at the cusp of, uh, of ring oozel migration um, at the moment. Um, I'd expect it more likely Dave's uh, group might have uh, might have stumbled across one, but who knows? Um, as uh, as we said earlier, we should always expect the unexpected. Um, Northern wheat ears are still, are still flowing through. Typically, they're the more larger um, birds, the Greenland wheat ears now. They, they're the more hardy and northern breeders that are coming through. Um, again, we're right at that tail end um, of uh, of migration for northern wheat ears, but you know we should still get some. Um, I was on the Isles of Scilly last week and had about seven or eight uh, coming through, so they're still making landfall on the uh, on the south coast. And uh, you know, fingers crossed, we might see one. 
And then the amazing looking wind chat. And yes, they actually look even better than that in real life. That orange breast, huge white supercilia. Um, uh, mostly they're, um, when, when you see them on surveys, they're out in the middle of rape fields. Can you imagine seeing that orange glow um, on that uh, on that yellow um, on that yellow flowers is just incredible. So we are going to be keeping our eyes open for a little bit of the uh, of the unexpected when we get there. But it's my absolute pleasure now. Simon, to, just uh, introduce. You, just, uh, Simon, oh, just sorry, you, Nick. Go on. Just before you introduce, Dave, there should still be. Uh, I imagine there will be one or two pairs, but. This, when I was there on a weekend, there's still 30, 40 linnet hanging around as well. So I mentioned you've yeah, not mentioned you know linnet what? here, but I there almost, should be a few linnet knocking around. But yeah, yeah, I almost kept linnet in as well, but because I was doing tricky pairs, I was thinking I can't really sort of pair linnet up with anything. But um, yeah, Jeff yeah, H. hopefully we'll yeah, uh, and, and linnets are in full song at the moment as well. So um, brilliant, thanks for that, Nick. Yeah, it's um. When Dave said he was going to, uh, he was going to talk about Merlin uh, uh, this evening. I sort of, I'd done a quick image search, and uh, this was the clay. This wasn't any uh, sort of, uh, you know, indication that Dave's uh, like an old wizard at all. Um, however, I do think your LinkedIn profile picture was uh, probably a, from a couple of years ago, but uh, devilishly handsome still, young man. Um, so I'm just going to hand over for this slide to uh, Dave, and he's going to talk us through Merlin. You're on mute, Dave. There we go. So I'm just going to select my screen for you. Um, I've just got a basically just got a three slides um, that I was just wanted to go through because um, on the session last uh, Saturday at um, Lodge Hill. I noticed that uh, we had some discussion about Merlin. I noticed that a few of you are, are using Merlin. And I thought I'd just sort of run through it for everybody so that we're, so we can all sort of be on the same page and just give you some idea in terms of some of the good bits and the bad bits and, and perhaps make a few suggestions in terms of how to use it in conjunction with your um, with your transects and things because um, I don't want to... Don't want to, um, to oversell it or undersell it. I just want to sort of give you some some feedback from having used it myself um, and what's good and what's bad and, and perhaps how to use it. And also for those who haven't tried it, um, um, how to uh, how to get hold of it and um, and to what to and how to use it. So Merlin is a, an app. You can get it from the app store, either Google or um, Apple. Um, it's basically it's um, it's been developed by Cornell University, and um, it's uh, Dave, just just briefly, Dave. Your screen's not sharing. I'm not sure if you wanted to share oh. with the slides or you've come off screen share. Um, sorry, I'm not. Um... So you can't see the slides at the moment. I can't anyway. I don't know if that's the same for anyone else. Yeah. Okay. Not uh... your slides. No, I I took mine off. Yeah, I thought I'd, I thought I'd done a share screen. Hang on a second. Screen. There were a couple of slides with the Merlin app on them, and then I think you took them off. Okay, is that better? Yep. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Slide share. All right, so yeah, so basically, um, let's just go back to the screen. Uh, so it's an app from Cornell University, um, and it it basically allows you to once you've downloaded it to your phone, you can then um, create a login, and then you can start to download what they call bird packs for various parts of the world. And obviously, the ones that you want to to start using would be um, the British Isles or the Western Palearctic or Western Europe. Um, so there's two or three bird packs that do cover our area. Um, obviously, the, the the wider the area, the more species that will be included, and the more space that will be taken up on your phone. 
but um, certainly do it. Um, download the, the packs that you want. And if you're going to any other parts of the world um, on holiday or whatever, then for sure uh, download the, the packs because um, as, a, as a, an online field guide, um, with photographs and, and sounds of calls and songs and so on, it's um, it's 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 incredible. It's 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 very valuable and it and it's free. But we're going to look at um, option three of the uh, the home screen. And this is all to do with the the sound ID. And uh, if you can see the, um, uh, the picture on the right, this shows the um, um, the, the screen. Um, that you can see when the uh, uh, when you select option three, which is sound ID, and you start to make a recording. So it actually uh, separates the screen into two major parts. So you've got the top part of the screen, which is the, the sonogram, um, which I'm circling there with the, the cursor. Uh, and that is a pictorial representation of the sounds um, that it's recording. Um, underneath, you've got um, a little line that says best matches, and there's a, a blue dot. And the blue dot indicates that it is actually picking up um, sounds um, of birds. And so look for those that look for that blue dot. And then underneath in this, this bottom sort of two thirds of the screen, this is where you get the list of the birds that it's hearing. So it's, it's listening to the birds, and it's comparing them with the, the sounds that it's got in the bird packs that you've downloaded. And it's coming up with matches um, and it comes up with them very, very quickly indeed. Um, so it's, 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 it's very, very good in that respect. So on this particular instance, it's picked up chaffinch and blackbird. And as the blackbird has got um, the cream background behind it, that is actually singing um, at the point that I took this uh, this screenshot, so the, uh, the, the the darker lines on this sonogram are the sounds that the uh, the blackbird is making that has been interpreted as a, a, a blackbird song. Something to to be aware of: if it comes up with a red dot next to the species, um, then that indicates that um, it is rare or unusual. Um, in respect of the area where you are actually making that recording. Um, so if, it's, if you've got location um, availability set, then it can, it, can, it can compare that and see whether or not it's something that um, is rare or unusual and will and we'll let you know as a result. Um, and at the bottom of the, the screen there, so I had a marsh tip um, calling in, in woods in, in Presswood last week. And it marked that with a red dot to say, yes, it's unusual in this particular area. Um, but um, again, um, it was it was singing um, and, and calling loud and clear. Equally, it could do the same with a snowy owl flying over Hewenden Park. But you know, you take you, you you look at it and you sort of take a pinch of salt in terms of some of the times in terms of what it might might be suggesting. So. That's how to sort of get it going. Um, if you, if the, the 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 lovely thing about it is that, you know, you can be you can be out there in the woods or going across the fields doing your transects, your two hundred meter transects, and um, you know it, it can come up with something, and it's always nice to be able to sort of visit it so whether the, the you're still recording or whether you stop the recording um, you can click on one of the species so the the, 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 the picture on the left is just the, the the sonogram at the start but if you click on one of the species it will actually take you to where it's recorded that species in the sonogram and this can be while you're still recording or, or after after the event which makes it great to be able to review something and to check it um, to, to see that you know you're, you're happy with that particular call or, or piece of song or whatever that you heard or whether it, it's just a bit of a um, strange noise that, that might have been interpreted badly by by Merlin but um, 
definitely uh, definitely worthwhile in terms of remembering that that, that is a feature that, that you can use. So in, in the, the times that I've been using it over the last um, sort of two to three weeks, here's some, some, some pluses and minuses in terms of the, the tool itself. Um, in terms of the pluses, it's, I, I think it's great for checking what you are actually hearing. And the, the key thing is when you're doing these surveys is that it's, you know, it's your ears and you don't rely on just Merlin picking stuff up and interpreting interpreting it for you, you've got to hear what 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 it is that's that's going on around you. It is great for picking up some of those short calls, and as Simon mentioned earlier, some of those songs and bits of calls that birds start to do, and it only sort of works its way into your subconscious after it's done it three, four, five times, a bit like the lesser white throat. You suddenly some stop and think that was a lesser white throat, and that's that's the second or third time I've heard it. Merlin will probably pick it up sort of the first or second time and come up with you and come up and, and list it for you. So it may be worth at that point just stopping and listening and, and seeing whether you can hear it again, as, as Simon said, you know, after another 15, 20 seconds, it will probably sing again. So it's also very good at picking up a lot of calls, especially the higher ones, and Tree Creeper may be one, Susie, um, for, for us oldies, I'm not including you on that in, in this particular uh, instance, um, you know, something like a, a red pole flying over or a, a tree creeper calling or even a gold crest or a fire crest calling. It's very good at picking up some of those calls and, and, and picking them up and interpreting, interpreting them correctly. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is you going across your transects and, and, re and recording what you hear and putting it onto your sheets. So it, it's it's a fantastic resource and it's and it's free wherever in the world that you are. But but don't rely on it as as such. You know, make sure that you hear what it is that you you, you are hearing um, and just use it as a as as an aid memoir and also as a as a reminder that there may be other things around. In terms of some of the minuses, it's not it's not great with some species, not not many, but song thrush, it doesn't seem to pick up song thrush very quickly. You can and you know from all your experiences now of song thrush being give a phrase and then it'll stop and think and talk about what it's gonna next sing next, and then it'll do that, and then there'll be another break of five to ten seconds, and then you'll get another phrase and so on. It doesn't seem to pick up song thrush very, very quickly. So bear that in mind. Um black blackcap garden warbler. Well, yeah, if it if it if it doesn't get the full song or it only gets a snatch of the song for whatever reason, sometimes it, it doesn't doesn't uh, identify that correctly. But then don't we all it will throw up some unexpected ones, so don't get too excited. But if it keeps on coming back and saying, I'm, going to, I'm picking this up, I'm picking this up, I'm picking this up, then it's time to go and, and, and investigate because you could be onto something um, something really good. Um, and again, it's very easy to be able to walk along and just look at the screen and look at your, you know, you look at your um, recording sheet and so on. But, but please don't do that because you need to be looking around you at the same time for the birds that are visible in the wood or over the field, flying over or flying along the hedgerow or whatever. So some suggestions from certainly for your, your recording um, purposes would be obviously to make sure that you've got the relevant bird packs downloaded. So either Western Paleartic, Western Europe or, or just, uh, just Britain. Um, perhaps at the end, at the start of each 200 meter section, turn it on and then review it when you get to the end of that section and see what's been recorded and, and, and check it against what you've actually heard and what you've been recording on your sheets and see whether uh, what, what differences there are and whether there's something that you need to, to, to revisit. Um, be pragmatic. You know, don't rely. It's not going to be 100% accurate. So, you know, you, 
there's, there's all sorts of noises going off all over the place. And some of them may be interpreted badly, um, but use it as a backup or a confirmation of, of what you are hearing. Uh, and then finally, um, when you get to the end of your, your, your kilometre square or your, your walk or whatever it is, don't forget to remove the recordings unless there's something that you want to, 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 to hang on to, because otherwise um, it'll fill up your, your memory um, pretty quickly. Okay, that's uh, that's me. So I'll stop sharing now. I just hope it's uh, been useful for you. But work, but try it out. Use it for your use it for yourself. It, it's it's a fantastic resource, um, and it's as I say, it's free. So you know, what's not to like? Back to you, Simon. Thank no, thank you, Dave. Um, there's been a few questions, but I think Nick's managed to answer a couple of them as well. Just how much space this does take up on your phone. Um, it looks as though the actual app takes up about 72 meg, um, but the actual pack, if you download it, looks like it's like 650 meg. So I guess yeah. you have a bit of space free of you. Yeah, but then micro SD cards are, are pretty cheap these days. So just just buy a couple of gig, well, you know, a few gigabyte card for a tenner and stick it in and stick it all on there. Unless, you, unless you've got an Apple phone, of course, which doesn't manage to do anything. <laughs> um, anyway. so i guess that's the thing is is uh yeah how how important is it to you if it means you have to get rid of all the pictures of your your children and grandchildren <laughs> so, uh, you can always save them back them up somewhere else um <laughs> wonderful thanks dave um yeah just the last few slides from me really um which is just the some of the logistics for uh saturday i'm not going to share the sound this time there we go so for those of you who are coming on Saturday, um, we're meeting at Lodge Hill. Uh, we'll be there at six o'clock. I tend to get there about 15 minutes before, so I'll be there about 5.45. Um, if you can arrive just before um, six o'clock, that'll be great. We are going to have our risk assessment forms. Uh, we, we write down all our emergency contacts. Um, those of you that are minding, I'll sort of print them out. You just tick your name off. So hopefully everyone will be on the, on the sheet there um and where it's going to be for those of you that have been before it's exactly the same car park um it's uh it's signposted off the um uh the 4010 the a4010 just um south of prince's risborough there and we're going to be parking in you can see there the a410 we're going to be parking in a um the, where it said elite pond covers um there's a uh, there's a parking area just by the barn in front of there. So that's where I'll be. Uh, and then we're gonna be sort of walking through those fields that you can see um, just to the left of Lee Road there. And we'll, we'll head up onto, uh, uh, onto Lodge Hill. Um, any questions at all about Saturday? Um, uh, or anything, that, any other questions at all? Because um, if there isn't, it's uh, be fantastic to see as many of you on Saturday. I know Colin was going to try and do the double, um, but he's uh, he's he, 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 he said he can't now. So so not to see you, Colin. It's going to be it's not it's not going to be the same without you, mate. Um, but um, yeah, if uh, if anyone's uh, got any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, or if anyone has any issues about parking on. Um, uh, Saturday please let me know if you are in a different group and you do want to come on Saturday if you could just let Nick know he can put you into bird skills um group one I think am I group one I can never remember from group one or group two um I always have to look at the uh, thing I'm, I'm group one brilliant um and what I do is when I get to the site I do a pin drop of the uh, location where we're parking so if people are having trouble finding it you can normally uh normally get the pin drop on there if that is uh, if there are no questions um can't remember my group will come on saturday that's brilliant deborah um uh if uh, I'll, I'll 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 ask nick to double check if you're in the group if not if uh if nick can put you in but uh, that'd be lovely lovely to see you deborah um there are no groups we're, we're just one big happy family just uh if you uh just let us know so we can control the numbers <laughs> That's absolutely fine, uh, Colin. You have a lovely time in Wales. And we're all going to get together in June anyway. Um, I'm, look, I'm quite looking forward to that. So. 
uh, sort of thing. So um, if nobody else has got any other questions, then I'm, you know, you're free to go and have dinner and all that all sort of good stuff that you do on a Thursday. And for those of you who I'm seeing on Saturday, I'll see you about quarter to six on that on Saturday morning. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. See you Thanks, soon. Simon. Yeah, have fun, everybody. Enjoy. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank see you. you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. I think Dave just did completely shoot off then, Nick. He's, he's just like, I've gone. I don't know if he's on a having his dinner or what he's doing, but yeah, he's gone. I think I'll he have is. to remove yeah. him now as well. He didn't even close him down for the meeting, he just left. Yeah, yeah you just, yeah, oh, there he's gone. He's gone now. <laughs> okay, mate. Thank you very um, much. No worries at all. And I'll, um, I'll let you know how Saturday goes. That sounds good. And in terms, just quick one in terms of, this morning, I've now got my oh, black you're still, trousers. You're, you're, you're still recording, by the way. Oh, yeah. Good point. Uh, do, 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 stop recording.